Hello, and thank you for joining today's presentation. My name is Carol Wyatt Evans, and I'm the Chemicals and the Environment Agent here at the University of Florida Extension Office in Sarasota County. Today's presentation is on pests and pollinators of Florida urban landscapes. So let's get started. So for the program today, we'll cover a quick overview of insects and insect morphology. Um, we'll talk about insect life cycle and development talk about the primary pollinators in Florida, as well as the primary pests in our Florida landscape. And then finally, we'll talk about pollinator-friendly practices. Now, please remember that when we talk about insects, it is an almost an overwhelming subject since there are close to 1 million described insect species. So when, you know, what we cover today are just a few examples of the pests and pollinators we find here in the Sunshine, sunshine State. Insects rule the world. Well, in the world, there are approximately 1 million described species of insects. There are approximately 91,000 insect species found here in the United States alone. Um, fossil records show insects came on land more than 350 million years ago, but there were they were fairly latecomers as other arthropods were already present. So arachnids, which include spiders, scorpions, mites, and the meropods, which are the centipedes and millipedes, were already, were already here. Um, thinking of that 1 million species, it's estimated that there are about 2 billion insects for every human on Earth. So insects truly do rule the world. Um, when we talk about insects, though, only about 1% are considered pests in the urban ecosystem. 99% of all insects are either beneficial and feed on other insects, serving as food for insects and wildlife, helping to recycle plant and animal matter, pollinating our crops, so essential components of our natural ecosystem. The vast majority of insects are benign or, or beneficial. So, you know, for example, a cockroach can be a real pest when they come in, you know, into our homes and invade our homes, but in the landscape, they are detritivores and they're important contributors to helping in the breakdown and recycling of organic matter. They are also a primary food source for other insects and small mammals as well as reptiles. So cockroaches actually can be considered both a beneficial as well as a pest insect. Um, people are uncertain of insects because they don't, uh, they don't know their ecological value or their life history. Many insects have immature stages that are extremely beneficial in helping to control pest insects. If people do not understand this cycle or they're unable to identify the immature insects or the adult insects, they may automatically think that those are the insects that are harming their plants because they might see a strange looking insect and then they see this plant damage. But in all reality, that damage is actually coming from the pest insect that that beneficial insect is feeding on. Now for the morphology of insects, I'm just going to touch on the general characteristics of insects. Um, now, again, you have to keep in mind since there is an overwhelming number of insect species, when we're talking about the morphology, um, it happens in general terms, and there is a great deal of diversity with everything we say about critters in the insect world. So um, insects have three body parts. They have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. They do have an, an exoskeleton, so their skeleton is on the outside of their body versus ours, where our skeleton's on the inside. They have segmented bodies and paired jointed legs. Well, these segments and these joints, um, because of the exoskeleton, these segments and joints help them to be able to move around. Um, they do have uh, wings. Some have two pair of wings, but others only have one pair of wings. Some don't have any wings at all. Um, they breathe by either gills, trachea, or spiracles. Um, here we have uh, immature uh, mosquito larvae and they are, are, they live in the water, and so they have this uh, siphon tube. So the immature stage lives in the water until it pupates out into a, an adult mosquito that flies. But they also have a digestive, circulatory, and a nervous system, somewhat like ours, but not really like ours. Now, insect success. So they can produce large number of offsprings quickly and have multiple generations a season. This is also the reason pesticide resistance is, you know, can be such a problem in, in some specific insects. Um, camouflage, so camouflage allows them to blend really well into their environment and they go undetected until if they're a pest insect until all of a sudden we see the, the damage of our plants. Um, they have, uh, 
that waxy protective outer shell or exoskeleton, which helps keep moisture inside the body and stops them from drying out. And then they are small and they can fly. So their small size and that ability to fly permits them to be able to escape from enemies as well as to disperse to new environments. In Florida, we have about 15,000 native invertebrates, where we have about 1,500 endemic invertebrates, which means that they are only found here um, in this particular area. Now, as far as insect growth and development, I won't get too far in the weeds with this, but there are two different types. There's what we call complete and incomplete metamorphosis. And metamorphosis just describes how that insect grows, how it goes through distinct stages going from an egg to an adult. And an incomplete metamorphosis, also called simple metamorphosis, it consists of three stages of development. So you have the egg, you have the nymphal stages, and then you have the adult stage. In incomplete metamorphosis, that nymph stage looks basically like a mini adult. They just don't have wings yet. Sometimes they're a little bit different color as well, but they're just really a small version of that adult. A few of the insects that go through uh, incomplete metamorphosis are cockroaches, crickets, chinch bugs, um, mole crickets, and grasshoppers. Now, insects with incomplete metamorphosis, um, typically both the adult and that, that nymphal stage eat the same thing. This is important when it comes to uh, determining some sort of a control strategy, especially for particular insects. Now, complete metamorphosis has four stages of development. So it goes from an egg to a larvae to the pupal stage and then into the adult stage. The larval stage looks very different than the adult stage. The immature stage also lacks wings, and in all immature insects, um, that immature stage lacks wings until it molts into that adult stage. When we talk about complete metamorphosis, that immature stage looks completely different than the adult stage. Insects with complete metamorphosis where the adult and the larval form eat completely different things uh, for most of the most of the time. Um, you know, here we have a, a lady beetle as our example, although both the adult and the immature stages do, they're, they're a natural enemy, so they both eat kind of the same thing. Um, but if you think about like a, a, a lepidopteran, so a butterfly, you know, it's a caterpillar as its immature stage, which eats plants. And as it, it pupates into an adult, that adult butterfly is now a nectar and a pollen feeder. Um, so some of those with, with complete metamorphosis are butterflies, moths, um, beetles, the lady beetles, and lacewing. Um, with all insects, only the immature stage molts or sheds their exoskeleton. Um, this is because that immature stage needs to grow. Once they're adults, they no longer need to grow bigger. And for the most part, their energy goes into reproduction. And some adults may or may not even feed or may just feed a little bit because they're really putting that effort into reproduction. This is also the primary reason why the immature stages are generally more destructive to plants. Um, they are like our own children and they are bottomless feeders, right? Um, due to that quick generational time, it's impressive how quickly those nymphs um, and those larval stages can pro progress through those molting stages, which are called instars, and become adults. But this does take all a lot of energy. It happens quickly. So that energy basically is in the form of food. So the last thing to point out is that the adult stage is the only stage that has wings. This is one really easy way to tell if you're looking at an immature or an adult uh, insect. If it has wings, it's definitely an adult. Um, if it's an immature, even with an incomplete metamorphosis, you may get wing pads or wing buds, but until it has a full set of wings, this is still considered an immature insect. Now on to pollination. So um, more than 80% of flower plant, flowering plants require pollination. Um, without pollinators, we would most likely lose foods like almonds, apples, bananas, chocolate, and coffee, just to name a few. 
But here in Florida, um, we would lose valuable crops, including avocados, watermelons, strawberries, and blueberries. Honeybees are vital to the survival of crops. Um, in fact, honeybees are so essential that every year millions of dollars are spent transporting them across the country in order to ensure that those crops like the blueberries and our watermelons um, can produce fruit. So although we are dependent on the honeybee, um, the European honeybee is not native to the United States and then therefore it's not native to Florida. Um, honeybees um, belong to the insect family Apidae, and they're native to Europe. Um, they were introduced when European colonists brought them uh, to da Jamestown uh, in 1622, um, which is now called uh, Virginia, right? They were brought for their honey and their wax production, as well as their ability to pollinate the crops that they brought with them, which included at the time apples, oranges, kiwi fruit, as well as pears. Now, native pollinators. Although honeybees may be the primary pollinator of crops, native pollinators, although are, you know, are often overlooked and are more essential to the survival of many of our native plants. Um, Florida has three major pollinators, which are our insects, our birds, and our bats. Insects are by far the most common and numerous of the pollinators, and they visit more plants overall than any of the other pollinators. Uh, the insects that serve as primary pollinators are multiple species of bees and wasps, uh, flies, moss, butterflies, and beetles. Uh, we'll talk about each uh, representative of those uh, as we go through this presentation. Now, birds and bats, however, pollinate differently, and they tend to be more specialized to larger flowering plants, which typically require more pollen, but they are also responsible for the movement of seeds and fruit as well. Birds are very good pollinators of many of Florida's wildflowers, and as well as transporting their seeds, but bats are very effective at pollinating nighttime flower, flowering plants, which include things like mango, mangoes, bananas, as well as guava. But bats also transport fruit around. It just depends on that bat species. Now, just a quick thing about bats. Um, bats are native to Florida. They are an essential part of the ecosystem and they're a huge contributor to controlling agricultural crop pests. Uh, there are approximately 13 species of bat in Flor bats in Florida um, and they reside here either full-time or, or maybe just uh, at times just part-time. All bats feed on massive quantities of insects. Um, they feed on beetles, plant hoppers, tree bu true bugs, flies, mosquitoes, moths, flying termites and flying ants, as well as the multiple, you know, multiple other insects. Um, most Florida bats are nocturnal, which means they are active at night, but some are crep crepuscular, which means that they're active during that, that dusk and or dawn uh, time of the day. Now, one insectivorous bat can consume up to 3,000 insects at night. So they are incredibly valuable um, resource um, to natural pest control. Now, the one thing you got to remember with, with bats, and, and I do the mosquito program, so the connection between bats and mosquitoes, bats will help to control mosquitoes, but they're not great at controlling mosquitoes. Because if you think about it, um, the amount of energy that a, a bat has to expel in order to catch a mosquito versus catching a moth is much, much higher. So they would have to eat a lot of mosquitoes to compensate and, you know, that would equate one moth. So they're more likely going to prefer a moth over a mosquito, but mosquitoes are part of their, of their nightly diet. Now, one plant that I want to talk about in respect to bats, but also because it's incredibly important to a whole host of native wildlife, and that's the cabbage palm. Um, it's definitely an amazing, albeit not very flashy plant, uh, that's native to Florida and very important part of a healthy ecosystem. Now, cabbage palms provide both shelter and food to migratory songbirds, to woodpeckers, butterflies, honeybees, uh, bats, tree frogs, as well as other wildlife. Uh, when that flowering stalk is removed, it doesn't cause really much damage or harm to the, to the palm, but when you remove those flowering stalks, it can reduce the food availability for that, you know, our local wildlife. We tend to like to tidy up 
our landscapes. So it's really popular to remove all those, those dead leaves as well as a number of the green leaves from the cabbage palm. But for Florida's wildlife, um, including bats, they depend on these palms for shelter as well as for their seeds. So um, one way to invite bats uh, to your landscape is by leaving basically a big round head on that cabbage palm tree. And that includes leaving those brown and, and dead leaves on there or uh, fronds on there. Um, other ways to encourage bats, including you know, leaving old dead trees or snags, which are often home to uh, free-tailed and big brown bats. Uh, leaving the Spanish moss in trees because that also collects insects. So they it's a great food source for the bats as well. And then putting up bat houses if, it, if you have a good spot for them. The one thing about bat houses, you know, typically, you know, they will say, if you build it, they will come. That's not necessarily true for bats. Bats are quite particular. So you really have to um, have that bat house in the right location, uh, the right height, as well as the right dimensions for that for those bats. Um, but there's a lot of stuff on the internet about how to build a great bat box. So um, I just wanted to point out about the cabbage palm and how vital it is to our uh, our Florida ecosystem. Now we'll start off. Um, wanted to talk about you know what about butterflies? Well, we see them all the time fluttering around, right, from flower to flower. But it turns out that butterflies are really quite ineffective pollinators when it when, when we compare them to other insects. Um, butterflies are really just getting a free lunch from the plants without returning much in favor. Um, however, they are amazing creatures and provide a role in the, in the pollinator world. So I'm going to talk about one only one butterfly, um, but I also wanted to talk about butterflies just because, you know, who doesn't love a butterfly? Um, so this butterfly is extremely common and often overlooked, but one of my favorite because it's so abundant, and that's the white peacock butterfly. Now, white peacocks are part of the family of brush-footed butterflies. They're small to medium in size. Um, they are white with brown markings, and they have orange margins along their wings, and they have small black spots in the center of each forewing. The two small black spots on each of the hind wing, uh, they resemble peacock eyes, which gives the butterfly its common name of, you know, of the white peacock butterfly. And like many other butterfly species, um, the male and the female white peacock butterflies are identical. Well, you know, sometimes the, 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 the genders, uh, they vary in their coloration and their patterns, but in this case, they are identical. White peacocks are small and, and darker during our wet summer months. And then they grow larger and they're more pale looking um, in our drier winter months. They are very common in Florida with multiple generations, so they can be seen year round. And they have a lifespan of about four months. So these butterflies, they love warm weather and they thrive in, in South Florida. Um, they're usually found um, in ditches and canals, um, along pond edges, in marshes, lakes, um, along roadsides. Basically, anywhere you have uh, low-lying, weedy plants. Um, and when white peacocks uh, fly, they stay really low to the ground or fairly low to the ground since that's where all their, their food source is. So um, this is one another way you can tell a, a white pe peacock butterfly is when they float, fly low to the ground. Now, the host plants of the white peacock butterfly include uh, the herb of grace, wild petunia, uh, southern frogfoot, um, Carolina false vervain, and turkey tangle frogfoot, also called uh, matchweed. Another really uh, common uh, weed or, or food source is uh, beggar tick, which is Biden's alba. Uh, I'd say that uh, the matchweed and Biden's alba are two of very, very good uh, food sources um, for all kinds of wildlife and all kinds of insect and pollinators. I love the matchweed. I think it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful ground cover. Unfortunately, here we tend to call it a weed. Um, but these are just a few. There's quite a few different uh, uh, sources. I just wanted to show an example of a few of them. Now, moving on to our next pollinator or pollinators, uh, our key pollinators in, in Florida are native bees. 
So I know that this picture is of honeybees, but I really like the picture. <laughs> um, there are approximately 315 species of native bees in Florida and about 4,000 in North America. But Florida has at least 29 endemic bee species, which means they're found only in Florida. Native bees either nest in the ground or in communities, or they can be solitary. Um, however, our most prolific pollinator, the European um, honeybee, it nests in community hives and it is not native to Florida, as we've already mentioned. Um, although it's not native, um, the honeybee has become a part of our natural environment ever since their arrival, and they're an integral part of our nation's crop protection. Um, production, excuse me. Um, unlike native species, the honeybee can be managed to benefit uh, pollination needs of certain crops, and they contribute significantly to the food supply. So honeybees are considered a commercial pollinator. While the honeybee is attracted to native Florida plants and they do pollinate them, our native Florida plants are not dependent on honeybees, but they do, re you know, they do uh, rely on our native pollinators. Honeybees are, are mainly a biological tool, tool that's used in uh, production agriculture. Now for our first native pollinator, um, native bees make up the bulk of Florida pollinators. And one of those is a group of halicid bees. So halicid bees are small and they can be very colorful. They're sometimes called sweat bees because uh, further north, what happens is uh, members of, of the family of bees will land on mammals, you know, like cows and horses and, and goats, um, and they will drink their sweat. So um, Florida is home to over 60 species of bees in this, in this diverse group, which has a large range of sizes, colors, as well as behaviors. Um, the metallic green sweat bee really stands out. It has this real flashy green metallic body, and it's quite mesmerizing if you take time to, to watch them dance from flower to flower. Um, of this group, they're really the easiest to pick, um, to pick out, and some are very common in both our natural and our urban areas. The color of these bees can range from anywhere from this bright, beautiful green to kind of a brassy yellow, and even a bright blue in some areas. Uh, most of the metallic green sweat bees can be see, seen almost um, the whole year. At, um, so really though, starting in February and March and going through, uh, through November and even into December if it stays warm enough. So many of the metallic green sweat bees are solitary and they nest in the ground. Although the females uh, may share an entrance uh, to that nesting site, but once they get underground, each female then uh, that those burrows will branch off and e each female has her own burrow. Now, the next group of bees are the leaf cutter and the mason bees in this family of uh, Megachilidae. So first we'll talk about the leaf cutter bees. So this is an interesting group of bees that collects pollen on specialized hair underneath their abdomen instead of on their legs. So they do a bit of a bee dance where the female, what she'll do is she'll, she'll bump her butt up and down on the flower to get that pollen to stick to those hairs that are under her abdomen. So this group are called leaf cutter bees due to their nesting habitats. So the female cuts an almost perfectly round piece of leaf um, and then uses that to line the inside of her nest with, and then that helps to protect the nest from moisture. The plants can usually tolerate this damage, right? And they don't really suffer much in the long run. I actually love going out and looking at my plants and every time I see this, this perfectly uh, cylindrical cut in my, in my uh, plant leaf, I know that I've had a leaf cutter bee around. But when building nests, the females collect materials like leaves, but they also collect flower petals, uh, plant or animal hairs. Um, mud resins they use to line the walls of each of their cells, or they use it to separate the cells. Um, they can nest in either pre-made cavities in wood, in hollow stem, uh, plant stems, uh, in crevices under bark or rock, ex exposed rock, um, or even just dug into the ground. So the actual nest of a leaf cutter bee looks like a long leafy cigarette. So, or cigar, sorry. Um, so this is a picture of a leaf cutter nest. The leaf cutter bee species in this area of Florida emerge from their nests in the spring, and then they can be seen flying around until uh, late fall. Now, the mason bee and the cuckoo bee are also in this family and affected pollinators. 
Now for the mason bee, which these two up here are mason bees, um, these bees emerge from their nests in early spring, but they have a pretty short season. So roughly they run from uh, March to into May. So mason bees usually use mud to separate the cells in their nests, um, but others use things like chewed leaves uh, to separate cells and also to seal off that nest. Many mason bees in Florida are metallic blue, really, really beautiful metallic blue. But in other parts of the country, it can vary and some might be either like dark or bright metallic green or even black. Now, the cuckoo bee, um, this is the other large group of Florida's megachilids, um, and there are the cuckoo bees. Um, their common name mimics that of the cuckoo, cuckoo bird for the same reason. So these bees are kleptoparasites. So they don't have to collect pollen or nectar or build nests since they lay their eggs in the nest of a host species. So uh, where that egg then hatches and feeds on the pollen collected by that host bee, but then it will eventually eat that host larvae as well. So because of this, um, they don't have much hair on their bodies, right? Because they're, they don't have to collect any pollen. And then they have a very, very tapered abdomen. This is a, a real uh, characteristic of a cuckoo bee and it makes them a little sinister looking. Now, the next group of bee pollinators are in the family Apidae. Um, this includes the honeybee. But this group uh, are the large fuzzy bumblebees and carpenter bees, uh, which serve as important uh, pollinators. So up here we have uh, our carpenter bees, and here we have a bumblebee. Now, um, bumblebees are quite recognizable with that really large fuzzy black and yellow striped body and that really loud buzzing. So you usually hear them before you ever see them. Um, they're very efficient pollinators. And since, uh, you know, since their body fuzz, it both collects and transfers pollen between flowers. Now, bumblebees are very important to plants that have special anthers that only release pollen when they're properly shaken, sort of like a 007. Um, so, Blueberries, tomatoes, eggplants, um, and kiwi are a few examples of fruits that um, are, are, this is called buzz pollination. What it does is the vibration from the honeybee's wings um, when they land stimulates that plant to release that pollen. So it's, it's what's called bee, uh, bees, bee buzz pollinated. Now, bumblebees are social bees with one primary queen. Um, in early spring, that queen comes out of hibernation. She searches for a nesting site, such as like an abandoned rodent nest or in a mound of grass even. That colony grows and peaks in the summer, and then it declines towards, uh, as we get into fall, uh, with the decline of nectar sources. So unlike honeybees, the colony only makes enough honey to support the colony. Now, carpenter bees, um, uh, you know, they're familiar to many homeowners, um, and that's because that female carpenter bee will excavate uh, the, their nest into wood. They can be considered minor pests because of those holes that they will drill in trellises or your, the, you know, eaves of your roof, but they are a valuable pollinator in wild and urban garden habitats. So, you know, if all possible, they shouldn't be punished or killed. Uh, the carpenter bee is, bee is very similar in appearance and size to a bumblebee, but their abdomens typically are shiny black with, with only a very few uh, amount of hair on them. Now, uh, flowers for bees, this is an overall general statement about uh, flowers uh, and, you know, flowers for bees. Now, a majority of bee species typically vi visit uh, flowers that are full of nectar, um, they're brightly colored with petals that are usually blue or yellow, or a mixture of the two. Bees can't see in the, that red wavelength, so although they may inadvertently visit a red flower, you are going to attract more bees with, with those blues and those purples and those yellow flowers. Now, usually flowers that have really sweet aromatic smell or even a minty fragrance to them, um, flowers that are open during the daytime, um, because that's obviously when our bees are out pollinating. Uh, flowers that provide a landing platform, especially for those heavy-bodied uh, bees like the bumblebees and the, uh, the carpenter bees. 
and they tend to like uh, flowers that have bilateral symmetry. So, uh, you know, when they, the, the uh, flower mirrors itself. So again, those are just kind of general generalizations for, uh, to attract, you know, what flowers to use to attract bees. Now, some of those flowers can be, uh, so the Canadian gerrymander, uh, again, we have the matchweed, uh, blanket flower, dune sunflowers, as well as uh, beggar tick, right, that Biden's alba. So uh, again, these are just some examples. Now, our next pollinator are, is in the order diptera, so these are the flies. So these are frequent flower visitors and effective pollinators. Um, some common groups include the Cerfidae, uh, the Bombaliidae, and the Tachinidae, as well as the California uh, uh, groups. So this order includes different types of insects, which include the houseflies, mosquitoes, horseflies, and fungus gnats. So there's, there's quite a, a, a few different ones within this group. And although we tend to think of flies as pest insects, uh, many families are important to plants. Uh, these include both those, the, what we call the innocent or non-biting species, as well as some of those biting species. There are various reasons that flies visit flowers. So some of them actually do gather uh, nectar or pollen as a food source. Um, others use it as kind of a meet and greet on the flower in order to mate. And then others use it, um, they lay their eggs on the flower so that the larvae then can eat, uh, eat part of that, you know, that floral, or they eat the fruit tissue as, as they develop. Now, short tongue flies are a group of flies that feed on flowers that imitate other fly food uh, sources. So these flowers, uh, the flowers of these plants, uh, sometimes they may trap that, uh, that fly inside of that flower as that fly tries to feed. Others, such as like the carrion flies, they're attracted to, to flowers that are, have a real putrid odor, um, those that resemble rotting organic matter. And then a few of the plants that attract these flies are things like pawpaws, uh, trilliums, and then some orchids as well. Now, some additional flies that are important um, as general pollinators are the long-tongued long flies. Um, so these are our cifridid and our uh, bomb bombolids. Um, sorry, I always, I, I can never say the Latin names very well. But they also feed on the same type of flowers that bees do. So some of these species have long, have tongues as long as their bodies. So many of these flies look very much like bees. So they are also referred to as bee mimics. So the tachnid fly, um, the tachnid fly are extremely diverse group with over 1300 species in North America. Um, they're often fairly uh, robust in size, so they can be up to like three quarters of an inch long. And they vary in color from like a drab brown or a yellow to like this really flashy iridescent blue, sort of like this one I have up here on the on the um, slide. The most conspicuous technids um, have spiny bodies and they have bristly hairs that can be quite long and dense, especially on the fly's abdomen. So the adult technid fly, they visit flowers to feed on nectar, although some of them also feed on pollen, um, which you know, makes them a really good pollinator. Because as the fly fly as the fly goes from flower to flower in search of food, that pollen collects on their tongues, it collects on their legs, as well as on that, you know, all that hair on their body. They feed on flowers with easy, easily accessible nectar and pollen. This is kind of true for almost all of the flies. It's kind of like it's a, if it's an easy food, then 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 they're there. Um, they tend to be generalists and they're not fussy about which flowers they visit. But in addition to nectar, uh, the adult tachnids uh, regularly feed on tree sap as well as honeydew that's excreted by aphids and scales. So if you've been to one of my other programs um, or you know that you know, a lot of the piercing second insects like aphids and mealybug and scale, they excrete honeydew. So basically it's a, a, a sugary insect poop. It's really high in, in sugars and carbohydrates. And so um, these tachnid flights also feed on that honeydew. But these flies are often overlooked in the garden and, and they're key insects uh, since, it, since the tachnid fly larvae 
are parasitoids of other insects. So caterpillars are one of their favorite. Um, a lot of times you might see like the long horn, uh, the, uh, sorry, the hornworm caterpillars that have all those little white things sticking out of it. Well, that has been a parasitized uh, hornworm. And all of those white things are the pupil cases of a tachnid fly. So that's something you really want to see in your garden. Now, now the surfid flies um, also call, are also called flower flies. And they're uh, among the most colorful and conspicuous insects found around flowers. Uh, there are nearly 900 species in North America, with most of them having like a yellow and black stripe, which makes them excellent mimics of, of wasps and bees. So flower flies, flies they can't sting, but um, they sound and they look like, like insects that do sting. So that makes, you know, other predators like birds or other, other um, wildlife typically will avoid uh, trying to eat them. Now, flower flies are not only important as pollinators in farms and gardens, but they are also really good at uh, helping to control pest insects. So again, as we talk a lot about these pollinators, they're kind of in that crossover of being both a pollinator and a natural enemy. Um, so they're beneficial in more than one, one aspect. Now about 40% uh, of the world's species belong to the groups with the larvae that eat aphids and scales and other soft-bodied uh, pest insects. So the larvae is grub-like. Um, because these are fly, they're actually maggots, um, but it's they're grub-like and they can you can see them. They're usually uh, bright green and you can see them eating aphids in, in your garden. So if you see a green worm-like thing on your plant, that is a good thing. So don't, uh, don't try to kill it or knock it off. It's, it's um, nature's pest control in action. But now the bee fly. So this is the bee fly down here. Uh, bee flies are found early in the spring. Um, they're fuzzy insects that fly and hover just above the ground. And like some of the bumbles, bumblebees they're, uh, that are brown and furry, and they make a buzzing sound when flying. So they are, they're like a little puff ball. Um, they're easy to tell from a fly, tell um, from a fly since they have only two wings, that they are a fly since they have two wings. Um, they have a long, they have long skinny legs, they have big eyes, and they have very short antennae. So as you see here, they have a really long uh, proboscis. So they are aggressive flyers and they can hover in midair. They move really fast and they have like an amazing maneuvering ability. So they can change directions in a blink of an eye. So um, they can do a 180 and go the other direction, you know, in a split, split second. So, and they have that, that long stiff tongue or proboscis and they use that for probing into flowers. Um, and then the, they use it to sip the nectar out um, Why they're hovering above the flower. So, the interesting thing about these bee flies is that they don't land on the flower. And this allows them to avoid predation um, of things that may be hiding inside that flower, such as like crab spiders or, uh, or ambush bugs. So um, despite this behavior of hovering above the flower, you know, they might barely touch the flower, but that's usually just enough to get that pollen to stick onto all that, that you know, that body of fuzz in those hairs and they can transfer it to an, to another flower. Now I'm not going to go into this uh, but uh, the foraging preferences for flies um, because flies are generalist foragers you know we talked about ones that that's you know kind of smell bad um, but they they like to be they kind of like ones that are kind of disc shaped or bowl shaped or shallow flowers, because remember we talked about their generalist feeders, but it, they like easy access. So things that have that, that uh, uh, shallow flowers where they, they have easier access to both honey and, or honey, both uh, nectar and pollen. So these are like our sunflower families, uh, carrot or parsley family, as well as like the mint family. So um, we'll go ahead and move on. So our next native pollinator is in the order Coleoptera, so this is the beetles. Now, there's a, quite a variety of beetles that visit flowers, and some of the scarab beetles uh, may be very common on certain flowers, but back to that sable palm. The sable palm typically has a lot of beetles. So again, here's another, you know, another 
positive aspect about this, the sable palm and having it around. But beetles are another very large and ancient group of pollinators. Uh, fossil evidence suggests that beetles were pollinating cycads, you know, even before the dinosaurs roamed the earth. Um, and they're also thought to have pollinated some of the earliest of the flowering plants. So modern descendants of primitive flowering plants, such as like magnolias, water lilies, and uh, anise, are all pollinated by beetles. So one common pollinator beetle found throughout Florida, as well as like really throughout most of the United States, is this goldenrod soldier beetle. So their populations peak in late summer and early fall, and it's perfectly timed with the bloom of the goldenrod. So these common beetles are, you know, they prefer sunny spots um, with, you know, that are high in rich nectar sources. Um, so, you know, they're often found in, in your garden as well as, you know, fields and along roadsides where there's a lot of uh, weed species. Now, soldier beetles are frequently confused with blister beetles. So here we have a soldier beetle here, and these three are blister beetles. So adult blister beetles uh, commonly feed on flowers and leaves, and as their name suggests, they secrete a defensive chemical that causes blistering. So soldier beetles, on the other hand, are not considered a threat to humans, and they're incredibly beneficial to have, you know, around the garden and in your, your uh, landscape. Now, an easy way to tell them apart is a, a soldier beetle has, their, this is called a pronotum, but think of it as the neck area. Well, this pronotum is wider than the head. Whereas on the blister beetles, they don't have, they have a smaller pronotum and the head is larger than their neck. So as long as you don't get those two things mixed up, you'll be good in knowing how to tell a soldier beetle from a blister beetle. Um, so some of the flowers for beetles, uh, you know, some in the families that generally consider to have evolved early in evolution of, of flowering plants that rely on beetles for pollination. So, you know, got to keep that in mind. So beetles typically visit uh, flowers that are that bowl shaped, kind of like with, with the flies, but bowl shaped that have their the, the sexual organs exposed. So these are like magnolias and tulip tree. Um, they like white to dull white or green type colored flowers. They like strong, uh, fruity smelling flowers, flowers that are open during the day. A little moderate nectar production. And some uh, maybe uh, some of these flowers are, you know, can be those large solitary flowers, again, like magnolias, as well as water lilies. Why others, they go to, you know, like the, uh, the goldenrod, you know, the smaller clusters of, of flowers. Now, our final pollinator is in the older order Hymenoptera. So these are the wasps. Um, a large number of wasps actually visit flowers for nectar. However, only a few wasp species are actually effective pollinators. One common, poll one common pollinating wasp is the, uh, is the golden dipper wasp. Um, you know, like other members of the thread-waisted uh, wasp family, the great golden digger wasp has a, this especially thin segment connecting their thorax and their abdomen. Um, they are anywhere from a half to one inch in length and sometimes even longer. So as you see here, here's a really good uh, um, shot of, the, of that thread waist. So this is, these are the thread waist uh, wasps. So on the golden digger uh, wasp, um, the rear segment of their abdomen is black. So here you see this back half of their abdomen. Um, that's black and the front half is red and or like a reddish orange color. And this, uh, the golden digger wasps, they're solitary. So you usually are only gonna see them like one at a time. And although they display these, these bright colors, um, which typically uh, bright colors in, in most organi organisms mean that that organism is some, in some way harmful, and so it's a warning sign. But for this wasp, um, these wasps do not exhibit aggressive behavior. Um, so they, you know, they'd re rather, you know, because they don't have a colony to defend, right, because they're solitary, they would rather really just retreat if they're threatened than to fight. Um, females do have a limited amount of venom, 
but they use that venom actually to paralyze small insects that they then feed to their larvae. So as you see here, we have one that's carrying a katydid. And what it's done is it's it has stung that and paralyzed that katydid. That katydid is still gonna be alive, but it's gonna carry this katydid back to its nest. And then its, its egg, once it hatches, is going, that larval stage is going to feed on that katydid. Now, like bees and beetles, uh, flowers for wasps can vary, but they prefer small clustered flowers and those that grow close to the stem. And they like these because that helps to support, right? Because they have pretty long bodies, but those small clusters help to support the weight um, and the length of those bodies. So now on to the pest part of the presentation. So although 99% of insects in the landscape are beneficial in some way, sometimes I know it seems like we only have pest insects in our landscape. So we can put pest insects into two categories. Um, and this is by the way that they feed on our plants. Um, so insects that cause a great deal of damage to landscape and turf grass. And, and those are our ones with our chewing mouth parts. And then the insects that have the ability to vector diseases to our plants. And those are the insects that have piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, and that piercing sucking mouth part is also called a stylet. So examples of insects with piercing sucking mouth parts are things like aphids, mealybug, and whitefly. So the insects that only cause aesthetic damage to our plants and do not vector the disease, diseases um, have those chewy mouth parts. And examples of, of these are going to be caterpillars, beetles, as well as mole crickets. So although a pest Aphids are actually probably one of my favorite insects because they have an amazing life cycle and they are a primary food source for many other insects and spiders. So aphids have a pear-shaped body and they come in all different colors and then they can also change colors depending on the season. So for instance, a green peach aphid can go from being bright green in the summer and then in the fall, the population tends to be a little bit darker, could even get to almost like a black color. And they show up in spring after we fertilized our plants and that new tender flesh is setting on the plant. So they tend to feed on the terminal ends of the plants, which makes them really easy to spot, but also fairly easy to treat if needed. So insects are, are uh, um, they are nitrogen limited. And so when we put nitrogen into our plants, all that nitrogen is used for growth. And so that's why we tend to find these insects on that soft new growth because it's really, really high in a nitrogen source. So aphids are amazing though. In spring and summer, the females reproduce asexually and they give birth to live young and all those live young are female. A female aphid can live for about 25 days and she can give birth to up to 100 live young. So an aphid can go from from birth to a reproducing female in less than one week. So the young insects mature very rapidly and the females reproduce at an amazing rate. So the insect populations increase you know, quickly. Winged females uh, may develop later in the season um, and that allows those insects to fly and colonize uh, new, new plants. They're fairly easy to control though. Um, a jet of water or a soapy spray, uh, like insecticidal soap, can be you know, quite effective at controlling uh, these insects. However, they are literally the chocolate candy of the insect world. So just about everything feeds on aphids. So having aphids around will most likely guarantee that you're gonna have beneficial insects in your landscape as well. There are many natural enemies that control aphids. So these are gonna include uh, predatory uh, lady beetles, hoverfly larvae, uh, parasitic wasps especially. Um, parasitic wasps are an amazing group of, of insects, uh, one I'll get into in a different presentation. Um, aphid midge larvae, uh, crab spiders, as well as lacing larvae are all things that will feed on, um, on, a, on aphids. Now, mealybugs is our next, next pest. Mealybugs are related to aphids. They're another soft-bodied insect that feed on that tender new growth of plants as well as that, you know, that soft terminal stem. 
So these piercing second insects, uh, they, they're, they are piercing second insects, so they do damage or they can deform the plant by their feeding. So as we look over here, I'm um, sorry, I have two monitors. Um, this is this is kind of a cabbage head or cabbage top to a hibiscus plant, and that was caused by mealybugs fee feeding on it. This is never going to recover and produce that beautiful hibiscus flower um, that you're hoping for. So it's really best um, best practice in this case to trim off that injury, um, you know, trim back that that twig, and so that plant can then flush out and create the the hibiscus flower that you're hoping for. When you trim it off, you know that you're going to remove all of the adults and the crawlers that are within that stem. So you've really reduced the likelihood of, of those mealybugs moving around and creating more damage on your plant. But like aphids, mealybugs have many natural enemies. Uh, so they are an important food source for other insects. However, if you do have a substantial infestation of mealybug, Insecticidal soap, oops, I'm sorry. Insecticidal soap is a great option if you need to turn to chemical control, uh, you know, for those, uh, to control those mealybug. Now, whitefly is the next pest. Whitefly are soft-bodied insects that are closely related to aphids and mealybug. Um, although they're called whitefly and they do fly, they are not flies. Uh, the adult actually prefers to rest on the leaves uh, rather than fly. What they do is if you disturb that, that plant, like if you tap it, they'll, you know, those flies will fly off and then they'll quickly retreat right back to, that, to, the, to the underside of those leaves. They're quite small and they're often found in clusters on the underside of leaves. And they're typically active during the day, so they're fairly easy to spot. So you can really uh, monitor and scout for whitefly fairly easily. Whitefly vector many diseases to vegetables, especially tomatoes, as well as ornamental plants, but um, especially during our warm weather. So it's really important that you monitor for whitefly because if they get out of control, they can get out of control uh, quickly. So you need to be aware be aware where they are in your landscape or your garden and you need to you know have some sort of a plan to try to control them. The adults lay eggs on the underside of the leaf so good scouting practices and habits are very important when it comes to monitoring especially for pest insects right but because insects are small um, they can desiccate uh, you know if it's too hot so most of them hide underneath leaves because that way they're, they're you know, staying out of, uh, out of sight of, of predators. They're retaining waters because it's not so hot and that sun's not baking down on them. So it's really important when you're scouting for any insect to make sure you just turn over leaves so that you can see the underside of that leaf. But for whitefly, if left uncontrolled, uh, they're gonna cause serious damage. But there are, you know, again, there are multiple natural predators of whitefly, and that includes dragonfly, lady beetles, lacewing larvae, um, spiders, as well as hummingbirds. So um, you you have a lot of a lot of uh, natural pest control out there to to support you. Now. Many of our beetles are considered beneficial insects, uh, but there is one that is the bane of many Florida yards, and that's the Sri Lankan weevil. Now the Sri Lankan weevil is an invasive beetle and its first identification in the United States was actually on citrus here, um, here in Florida at, in Pompano Beach. And, but it's now throughout you know, a lot of, uh, especially South, South Florida. The weevil is a grayish white dusty color and it has large eyes and long antennae. Uh, they're typically uh, dark splotches um, on the elytra. So the elytra is that hard outer outer wing of, of the beetle. So here we see, see the spots. The weevil causes damage by chewing on, on a host plant, uh, but due to their life cycle, they're extremely difficult to control and there are no uh, known enemies or natural enemies for these uh, Sri Lankan weevils. There are a few products on the market that have weevils on their label but none of them are actually very successful in helping to control them. Uh, the weevil can cause stunted growth, it you know, can defoliate your plant, and it can 
cause potentially can, can kill off the plant um, if they're left unchecked and their numbers increase. The best way to control this insect is the use of mechanical means. So this basically means placing a, a wide mouth bucket, um, like a cleaning bucket or a five gallon bucket of soapy water underneath a, a, an infested bush. And then you beat the bush with, whether it's a broom handle, you shake it. And what happens, the uh, defensive mechanism of beetles is to let go and they drop down into the mulch, right? So that they, they escape predation, they're down in, into safety. But when you put that bucket of water underneath them, basically they're following into that bucket of water and they're gonna drown. You can also do this with an umbrella where you open up, you invert and open up an umbrella underneath the plant and you let those, those bugs, you do that same thing, you tap it, those bugs fly into the umbrella, fall into the umbrella, you close the umbrella and then you pour it into the bucket. I personally have never had much success using an umbrella. So I really like the using a five gallon bucket of soapy water. Now, many caterpillars have host plants. Um, some will only eat plants, uh, such as like the monarch caterpillar we know eats milkweed. And although I've, you know, I've listed these as pests because there are some caterpillars that we do consider kind of true pests. Um, but some of them uh, feed on a few different plant varieties, uh, you know, as I'm talking about a host plant, but like the oleander caterpillar, you know, the oleander bush is its host plant, but it does feed on like the desert rose, as well as a few other plant varieties. But we have to remember, um, you know, if, if we're thinking about caterpillars as, as a pest, right? Um, the immature stage of lepidopterans, which are our butterflies and our moths, are caterpillars that they need to eat in order to transition into an adult moth or caterpillar, which is a pollinator. So although we may think of them as pests, we need, we need those caterpillars in order to have our adult pollinators. And again, you know, as we say that anything a with a chewing mouth part, like a caterpillar, is going to cause aesthetic damage, but it typically is not going to kill the plant, um, typically. But some caterpillars have interesting feeding patterns. Um, this means like some are gregarious feeders, and this goes into like army worms and oleander caterpillars are, are gregarious feeders. And this just means that they all hatch out at the same time and they feed in the same area together. So when they first hatch out of that egg, they're really tiny, really, really small, and they can't feed. Like typically we see a caterpillar feeding on the edges of a leaf, but the, when they're first hatched out, they can't, they, they can't eat their mouths are too small. So they cause something, um, you know, they eat the just the top tissue of that leaf. So uh, they eat that outer layer, and this is called uh, skeletonizing or window painting of that leaf. But as they grow, when they grow quickly, they're gonna start to consume that entire leaf. Um, and they usually only leave, you leave the mid vein or that mid rib. Um, however, if food sort, if their food is in, uh, you know, doesn't, if there's not much food source there, they will then also eat that mid rib um, as kind of a last resort. Now, oleander caterpillars, like monarch caterpillars, um, they sequester the toxin from that host plant. So there aren't really many other animals that are tempted to feed on them since they are, are uh, poisonous. Now, our final pest is truly a pest and one that can really uh, devastate and decimate a, uh, you know, your turf grass. And this is the mole cricket. So we do have three species uh, of mole crickets in Florida. So that's the short wing, the tawny, and the southern mole cricket. Uh, the males come out at night, out of their burrows at night, and they call to attract the females to their burrows. I personally think they're kind of like one of the ugliest of the of insects. They kind of give me the heebie-jeebies, but they, they, are, they are an amazing little insect. Um, they stay deep in the soil when it's dry, but when it, when it rains or there's some sort of a moisture or irrigation brings it closer to the surface. So a thing to remember, if you do end up having a treat for mole crickets, uh, you know, using a pesticide for mole crickets, make sure 
that that area is irrigated first. And what that's going to do is that they're going to drive those mole crickets closer to the surface. And that's going to make sure that, you know, help you make sure that you're coming in contact, that those mole crickets are coming in contact with that pesticide. Now you can see their tunnels, but you can also tell you have mole crickets if your grass is kind of spongy when you walk on it and it, it separates from, from the uh, soil. So this sponginess comes from the fact that as they're tunneling under the ground, what they're doing is they're eating the roots of that turf grass. So those runners are becoming detached from the soil because they no longer have a root system. So that grass eventually, that area of grass is eventually going to die because there's no root system to sustain that turf grass. Now, mole cricket damage is very different from that of chinch bug damage, um, but both can be equally devastating to turf grass. So chinch bugs, you see their damage is going to start usually close to like a driveway or a, you know, a, a sidewalk where it's hot and dry. And then it's always, always going to be in a sunny area where mole crickets, you know, they can start at those edges, but they, they don't care whether it's sunny or not because they live, you know, underground. And so they, they don't care if they're in a sunny location. So you're going to start seeing their tunneling in both shaded areas of your lawn as well as, as your, uh, your uh, sunny areas of your lawn. There are a few different biological controls for mole crickets that have been established in Florida. Um, one of them is the Lara wasp. Uh, this is a, a parasitic wasp that, uh, that lays its egg on a mole cricket or inside a mole cricket, and then that egg hatches and eats that mole cricket from the inside out. But there's also a parasitic nematode, which lives in the soil, um, or you can also buy it and apply it as a pesticide. It's a biological or microbial pesticide. Um, you apply that and then they then penetrate into the soil and penetrate into the, the nematodes when they come in contact with it. That's a little bit tough to do because they usually need high levels of these uh, parasitic nematodes in order to establish, but they're definitely worth you know, uh, repeating if you've had prior mole cricket problems, it's definitely uh, one avenue to take that's really beneficial, uh, you know, and it's, you're not applying uh, conventional chemicals to your lawn. Now, pollinators are in trouble. Um, they're in decline due to the part uh, to human impacts, and they really need our help. Um, so in Florida, pesticides and habitat loss play critical roles in species decline. So many pesticides um, aimed at limiting pests also uh, are deadly to pollinators. And large areas of lawn limit the available pollinator habitats. So if you have a lot of lawn, you don't have a lot of diversity. And more than likely, if you have a well-manicured lawn, you also don't have any weeds that are supporting, supporting pollinators. So we can make a difference and choose to help pollinators by doing a few simple things. So one is like mowing less. And this means just increase the plant variety that supports pollinators and beneficial insects. And, you know, try to minimize the amount of manicured turf grass that you have. You know, you know variety is a great thing in all walks of life. So, you know, that includes our wildlife. And then planting in clusters. Um, you plant in clusters to encourage pollinators to visit. Uh, kind of a rule of thumb was is sort of like to plant in threes. Uh, so plant three of every, every plant. Of course, that depends on the size of the plant, right? You're not gonna plant three uh, full-size firebush in one small area because that's just not, that's not the way you do it. But if you have three small, you know, you have begonias or you have some small flowering plant, you want to do in threes because the amount of energy those insects need to use because they are small, you want them to have ample, ample food source, right? Plenty of, of pollen, plenty of nectar in one little area so that you don't have to go far, but you will also be recruiting a lot more pollinators to your area. And then plant species that bloom across the entire growing season. And that's gonna ensure that there's continuous blooms um, early spring through fall for our pollinators. And then uh, providing places for nesting. So not only do pollinators need food, they need areas to nest and, and you know, their, their harborage. Using fewer pesticides or none at all, um, 
or applying them less often and using the least toxic pesticides. And then diversifying the yard space by planting more, um, more than just one plant. So the majority of insects are beneficial to the environment and they are often overlooked. Help save native habitats by providing, providing pollinators a place in your yard and maintaining our native ecosystem. And my last uh, slide here is just uh, pollinator friendly practices. This is just to bring it all together. Um, we can in implement in our own backyards to support pollinator uh, success. So things to consider when establishing, it, establishing a pollinator friendly habitat are things such as like foraging habit habitats. So cultivate native plants. Um, they're the ones that provide that, you know, that sustainable nectar and pollen sources. Oh, I did it again, I'm sorry. Um, as well as specific um, host plants for immature insects, right? Because they're also going to need to be able to feed. So these are our caterpillars, right? But then also be, you know, your foraging habit also equates to the, the flower color, the size, uh, the time of the year that they bloom, um, planting diversity, really. Um, these are all uh, important aspects uh, for supporting uh, pollinators. Then uh, pollinator reproduction. So this is wide ranging and includes both like proper food sources for, for both the adult and the immature insects, but also preferred locations uh, for trees or shrubs, um, the ground nesting locations, right? So they have to, that has to be amenable to their life cycle and, and, and be a place that they're gonna use. Kind of like the bat box, right? You have, they're pretty particular. So you gotta, you gotta build it right and put it in the right place for them to, to wanna use it. Really don't, you know, don't sterilize your backyard um, by getting rid of like every fallen twig and leaf. Um, don't prune off every brown, uh, palm, you know, uh, palm frond that you have. These are all areas that serve as nesting locations for pollinators as well as other life, uh, wildlife. And also, if you're making nesting boxes, um, make sure you use multiple size holes and uh, different types of nesting material. You can purchase bee nesting boxes, but they're really actually quite easy to make. Um, you know, I've done where I've bought one to use as kind of a model, or you can even just go on the internet and you know download all kinds of different uh, uh, you know recipes for making your own your own um, uh, nesting boxes. And then providing shelter. So this goes hand in hand with providing areas for reproductive success, but also providing specific plantings for insect harborage and their overwintering as well. Now, chemical use. Uh, think about your chemical use and try to avoid using chemicals if you can. So by creating a, by creating a, a, a welcoming habitat, the beneficial insects will be around to help you with those, you know, those areas of, of uh, pest insects that, that pop up. An integrated pest management program is critical component to maintaining a safe habitat for pollinators. Um, chemicals are part of an integrated pest management program, but they should be used, um, you know, as a last resort and reserved as that last resort, and they should never be the go-to solution for pest insect control. Um, monitoring, so this means to observe what plants are attracting what pollinators. Are you planting, are your plants providing adequate nectar and pollen for the pollinators? Do you need to add variety um, or do you need to add more of a particular plant or a, a, a particular color, color pattern? If you have a lot more of one type of pollinator, do you want to continue to, uh, to you know, bring those in or do you wanna try some different colors to bring in different types of pollinators? And then um, are the plantings that you have provided, are they unsuccessful? Um, and attracting pollinators and do they need to be replaced or maybe even just move to a different area of the yard. So these are all things to consider when planting a pollinator friendly landscape, but just remember it doesn't have to be perfect, right? You just need to start and it's all going to come together with time and with patience. So um, the website at the bottom of this slide um, is a great resource as well as the resources that I'm going to have on the next slide. So this is are the resources that I used to put together this presentation. And with that, I wanna say thank you for joining me today. It was a pleasure having you here. And I do hope that um, it gave you a little insight into our, our Florida native pollinators. <laughs>